Geoscience is an interdisciplinary subject. So what we are learning in stress and strain in the structural geology and tectonics will have of course application in other branches. Let's look at the geohydrological situation and how the stress balance can work in that case. We take the case of the Guyben Hertzberg relation. We will start with the prototype or the natural world scenario. Imagine this green line is the boundary between ocean and the land area. So this is the coastal area. Say this is the ocean water level. Now in the summer time particularly in the coastal area worldwide it has been seen that the saline water goes inside the land portion and this leads to salty water coming up in the wells in the land area and it gives a trouble in terms of ground water for the people staying in the coastal area. Now here imagine the water has gone in and this yellow line represents the extent up to which the saline water say of density rho s have gone inside the land part. Now what is happening in the land part there is already fresh water say density of rho f and what happens due to the saline water intrusion the lower density rho f rho f is less than rho s is pushed upward and imagine hf is the increase in height of the water table. Now this situation can be represented in terms of a model over here in the laboratory. So from prototype to model there is a conversion. Imagine there are two tubes which are connected at the bottom like this and here I have put saline water and at the other side I have put fresh water. For the time being think that saline water and fresh water do not mix together. Imagine like that. So what happens? This saline water being denser is pushing the fresh water upward. Where is the top level of fresh water? I have shown by this colored line. And where is the level of saline water? It is here. Now here just like we did for the isostatic balance that there is a piece of wood floating in water and the isostatic balance was made similar thing can be done in geohydrological case also. For example, say this blue line is the contact between the saline water and the fresh water then I can draw an imaginary dashed line over here that touches this tube. Say this height is equal to small z and this height is equal to hf. So I can write the pressure exerted by the saline water over this area by this volume of saline water on this line is exerting how much pressure? The density of the saline water multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity multiplied by height. Why this is so? For this you can click at this video where already I have described why it happens so, why this calculation comes, why this expression comes. Now in the right hand side, how much is the pressure exerted by the fresh water column over here? This is given by Z plus HF, the total height multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity multiplied by the density of the fresh water. So G can cancel out. When they will become equal? They will become equal when the there is an equilibrium condition in there is no movement, saline water is no more pushing fresh water up. So there is a stable condition has arisen. So in that case pressure exerted by the saline water over here and the pressure exerted by the fresh water column over there are have to be equal. So after doing that equality G cancels out and from here we can write Z is equal to such an expression. From here we can write rho F multiplied by rho S minus rho F is the difference in density so delta rho and then to the power minus 1. Now if we take the rho s the saline water density as 1.025 gram per centimeter cube and rho f the fresh water density as 1 gram per centimeter cube and we maintain this relation that the saline water density is more than the fresh water density and that is why the saline water pushes inside the inland leading to contamination of ground water. So in that case uh, from this expression we get z is equal to 40 hf. If naturally if we change these values little bit this instead of 40 some variation will come 38 to 40 might come. So in this way we can say that what we learned in, in terms of isostatic balance the same principle works also for the Guyben-Hertzberg relationship. Now 
just to compare this prototype and the model. In the prototype, again we are looking, this is the Z and here is the Z. Here is the HF, the water table, how much it got elevated and this is the HF. So from Z, HF is calculated and here what you can see, this is the Z and over which HF has been calculated. So instead of saline water and fresh water, if we take any two immiscible fluids such, a, such as water and kerosene, similar relationship can be established. But in case of kerosene, the density contrast with water will be different and so this instead of 40 some other expression might come. Imagine the fluid has a density stratification and in that case how to develop such an equation when there is a continuous density variation vertically down. Please look at this part of the video where this has also been described and some changes in this expression will be taking place. So this is an example I repeat where structural geological issue of stress and strain can also be applied in case of the geohydrological situation. Geoscience is interdisciplinary so once we are studying the stress and strain relationship we should also look at the other branches of uh, geology besides structural geology. When we study stress in geoscience, in structural geology and in tectonics, a few uh, ways of looking of stress will be important. One is known as hydrostatic stress also or known as lithostatic stress. We will also look right now a term known as deviatoric stress. So how to initiate? Think of a small cube. In my diagram it is a big cube but imagine it is a small cube and it is immersed in some fluid. In that case we can think that equal stress acts on the on all the perpendicular directions on all the perpendicular mutually perpendicular faces. This situation is known as hydrostatic stress or the lithostatic stress condition. Under such a stress condition no folding or faulting is possible. Folding or faulting will happen only when this hydrostatic stress situation is altered. So I can write here if in terms of symbol sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 and for hydrostatic stress sigma 1 equal to sigma 2 equal to sigma 3. Now imagine this cube is at some depth h or say z below the ground surface. Say this depth is z. Then we know the stress exerted by the column of rocks of z vertical thickness is given by so in that case sigma 1 becomes equal to rho multiplied by g multiplied by z. What is rho here? Rho is the density of the overburden material. Density of And imagine that the material is not deforming that means rho gz amount of stress acts in on all sides of the cube. Now imagine there is folding or faulting going to happen then this hydrostatic stress regime is altered and we get a situation where they are not equal either none of them are equal to each other or two of them are equal and one is unequal. Let us take that case. So here in such a situation where there is no guarantee or in fact they are not equal sigma 1 is not equal to sigma 2, sigma 2 is not equal to sigma 3 or at least or, or this is not the case other than this sigma 1 equal to sigma 2 equal to sigma 3 any other combinations of sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 are acting. In that case we define the mean stress sigma bar 
as the arithmetic mean of the three magnitudes which is so this is same as since each of them will have a unit of course say pascal so the mean stress will also be in terms of same unit pascal now what is the deviatonic stress here i can think this is the direction 1 along with sigma 1 has acted this is the direction 2 and say this is the direction 3 now we can write here that sigma 1 dash what is sigma 1 dash it is the deviatonic stress along direction 1 let me write this is the deviatonic stress along direction 1 and it is defined as sigma 1 minus the mean stress this is the mean stress expression which is here so from here i can write sigma 1 minus sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 divided by 3 which comes out to be 2 sigma 1 minus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 divided by 3. So this is the expression of deviatonic stress along direction 1. What it means? How much more is the actual applied stress sigma 1 from its average value in the three directions. So similarly we can define sigma 2 dash is equal to 2 sigma 2 minus sigma 3 minus sigma 1 divided by 3 and we can define sigma 3 dash the deviatonic stress along direction 3 as 2 sigma 3 minus sigma 1 minus sigma 2 divided by 3. So the viewers and the students need to remember the formula for mean stress and the hydrostatic stress. So in terms of symbol what can we write instead of writing sigma 1 dash sigma 2 dash and sigma 3 dash I can write sigma i dash is equal to sigma i minus sigma bar. The deviatonic stress along direction i is equal to the applied stress acting along i direction minus the mean stress. Okay. So now from here we can set a problem. We will first set a simple problem and then we will set a bit tricky problem for you to solve. An obvious thing also I can write from here. What is that? Sigma i dash plus sigma bar equal to sigma i. Just moving this over there. Okay. Now here comes the problem. Suppose I say that along the three directions these are the applied stresses. I have given some values. Okay, so here positive value means compression. If I write a negative value that would mean an extensional stress. And as per my diagram they are all normal stresses acting on for mutually perpendicular planes. So here the problem is how much is this? I will request even this simple problem do the arithmetic mean stop the video and then we can proceed. So I hope you have done this simplest of exercise. Now comes another problem. Now I am going to give an introduction for the next problem. If I write an equation x plus 3 equal to 7 and I ask you how much is x you can find out because there is a single equation and there is a single unknown. It is possible to solve. If I give two equations and two unknowns, you can find out x and y. Because I have given two equations and two unknowns. I am not talking about stress here right now. I am just talking about algebra. There are two equations and two unknowns x and y. It is possible to solve x and y from there. So extending this 
if we give three equations and three unknowns, it is indeed possible to solve those unknowns. For example, it will be possible to solve x, y, z because there are three equations and three unknowns. Now I am entering this issue of stress. If I ask you right now that I have given you the divinatoric stress values in three directions, I am going to give you some numbers here and I will ask you to find out Will you be able to solve? Because here will be three equations and there are three unknowns to solve. So logically it looks like yes it is possible. So if I give you the values right now just like this say this is 12.2 Pascal, this is 3 Pascal and this is 4.2 Pascal. Can you find out? these values. Just to recollect, by the way I intentionally erase the blackboard, just to recollect this means and similarly this and these expressions can also be written. So as you see there are three unknowns and I have given you three equations. So I would request you to pause the video, please do it, please don't proceed to see my answer. Think for a while and then only you reinitiate the video. I hope you indeed stopped and here I am giving you the solution now. If I give you three such numbers, it is impossible to solve sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3. Now this sounds strange, three questions and three unknowns, but it cannot be solved. Why? because these three are impossible numbers in this case. Why and why so? For that we need to look this equation, this equation and this equation. If you add them up, it turns out to be 0. Are they 0? If I sum up, in fact, 3 are positive, so they cannot be 0. So, the divinatoric stresses sigma 1 dash, sigma 2 dash and sigma 3 dash, if I say all are positive is impossible. If I say all are negative is impossible. But if I say any two are positive, another one is negative, this can be possible only if the sum of these magnitudes becomes 0 because algebra tells that. So therefore, this is an impossible combination. If we keep on working and fighting with the equations, we are not going to solve them. There will be some anomaly coming up while solving. So now, I will reframe the problem. I will say that sigma 1 dash and sigma 2 dash are given and my question is how much is sigma 3 dash? Since their sum has to be 0, so sigma 3 dash will be and how much time it took? Few seconds. So if such a problem comes, it should be taking only few seconds. The divinatoric stress in two perpendicular directions are given. Find out the divinatoric stress in the third perpendicular direction. Then the answer is sum the pump and then change the sign and that is the answer. And once we now observe this interesting relationship, is it because that we are dealing with stress, therefore the divinatoric stress sum becomes 0 or is it simply an algebraic relationship? Let us have a look. Now consider that there are n number of numbers sigma 1, sigma 2 up to sigma n. Here we are not considering sigma as stress, they are just numbers. Okay? So therefore, what is the arithmetic mean of this number? Sigma bar is given by their sum sigma i where i runs from 1 to n, their sum divided by n number of numbers. So there is divided by n. 
suppose I define right now sigma i dash is equal to sigma i minus sigma bar. Suppose we define suppose we define such a number for some purpose. Then as per this sigma 1 dash will be given by sigma 1 minus this average. So, which works out to be n minus 1 multiplied by sigma 1 then minus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 goes up to minus sigma n and then that is divided by n. Why it is happening that also can be said sigma 1 minus then here sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 etcetera divided by n. So, n sigma 1 minus sigma 1 becomes n minus sigma 1 and rest of the things remain as such. Now, what about sigma 2? It will be sigma 2 dash will be equal to sigma 2 minus sigma bar. What is sigma bar which is over here and similarly it will become just like this n minus 1 multiplied by sigma 2 then minus sigma 1 minus sigma 3 goes up to sigma n and then divide by n. So, then what will happen if I keep on writing up to sigma n dash is equal to some expression and then add up. So, this is the expression what will happen we will get a set of terms like this. So, that will be n minus 1 divided by n and then sigma 1 plus sigma 2 up to sigma n. So, that is what I am writing sigma i, i runs from 1 to n and then there will be another set of terms which are these terms. Now, what is happening in this term is that sigma 1 is missed once in this expression and in this underlying part there is no sigma 2 term. So, for n number of such terms the total number of time sigma 1 will come in this underlying portion will be n minus 1 times. The total number of times if I add up all these underlying portions sigma 2 term will come n minus 1 times. So, therefore, n minus 1 divided by n and then sum of sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 i equal to 1 to n. Now, eventually these two are same term therefore, their subtraction leads, subtraction leads to 0. So, what I understand is that if I define sigma i dash in this manner then sigma i dash for any set of numbers any numbers need not be stressed the sum will be 0. So, now as a special case if we think that we are dealing with the principal stress axis. So, there are 3 sigma values sigma 1, sigma 2 and sigma 3 that means n is equal to 3. In that case instead of n minus 1 there will come 3 minus 1 equal to 2. Recollect what we wrote for sigma 1 dash 2 sigma 1 minus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 by 3. 3 is n n minus 1 is equal to 2. So, here it is n minus 1. So, it is no surprise that for the dihyatonic stress cases in 3 perpendicular directions the stresses are acting this relationship will hold true. So, this is not the magic of stress this is the simply the obvious property of a set of numbers which in case of principal stress axis we are dealing with n is equal to 3. Okay. Now, Having said this, let us get back into the hydrostatic stress and I will make one very obvious statement, but it is worth stating. We said that in case of hydrostatic stress equal amount magnitude of stress acts in three perpendicular directions. So, sigma, sigma and sigma. So, in this case how much is the mean stress? The mean stress is equal to sigma plus sigma plus sigma divided by 3 equal to sigma. So, therefore, in case of hydrostatic stress, how much is the dihyatonic stress? So, this is my direction 1, this is my direction 2, and this is my direction 3, then sigma dash along direction 1 is given by the applied stress sigma minus the mean stress 
sigma bar which is equal to sigma minus sigma equal to 0. Similarly, the deviatoric stress along direction 2 and direction 3 are also equal to 0. So, what do we understand from here? That in the case of hydrostatic stress regime or lithostatic stress regime, this happens sigma 1 dash equal to 0 equal to sigma 2 dash equal to sigma 3 dash. If this is stated, it automatically means a hydrostatic stress regime and we can write in a more cryptic manner, we can write sigma i dash is equal to 0 for i equal to 1, 2 and 3 will indicate the hydrostatic stress regime. We have seen mean stress and the deviatoric stress and in the same connection we can define the mean strain and the deviatoric strain. The definition remains the same and for that we will be using the symbol epsilon indicating extension. Simply speaking if there is a line of length L0 and that got extended to L1 then L1 minus L0 divided by L0 can be called as extension which I can write as epsilon or E. We will see other strain units later but with this basic information we can look into the mean strain and the deviatoric strain. Imagine there are three orthogonal axes 1, 2, 3 and there is a body that got strained along direction 1, direction 2 and direction 3. A little more to be explained with respect to the epsilon 1 or epsilon 1, 1, epsilon 2 or epsilon 2, 2, epsilon 3 or epsilon 3, 3. We said that epsilon 1, 2 and 3 act along direction 1, direction 2 and direction 3, but this itself is not sufficient. The strain epsilon 1 must act along direction 1 in this way. Epsilon 2 must act along direction 2 and being a normal strain on the BC plane. And in case of epsilon 1, it must act as a normal strain on the AB plane and epsilon 3 must act as a normal strain on the AC plane. It is not correct to say that epsilon 2 or epsilon 2 2 represents strain along direction 2. Why? Because strain along direction 2 can indicate a normal strain and any shear that works on the AB plane. This shear strain is not considered over there. So, I make it clear that epsilon 1, 2, 3 are basically normal strains on the planes and the epsilon is calculated along those directions. So, we can write those strain let us say along direction 1 either as epsilon 1 or epsilon 1, 1 in this way. Then along direction 2 in that way epsilon 2 or epsilon 2, 2 and then epsilon 3 or epsilon 3, 3. So, the general symbol can be if I use this sigma epsilon 1, epsilon 2, epsilon 3, I can write epsilon i where i runs from 1, 2 and 3 and here of course, I can write this as say epsilon i i or epsilon j j where again i is equal to 1, 2 or 3. So, now we can define the mean strain is the arithmetic mean. So, it is epsilon 1 1 plus epsilon 2 2 plus epsilon 3 3 divided by 3 or you can write epsilon 1 plus epsilon 2 plus epsilon 3 divided by 3 is equal to epsilon m. So, symbol wise I can write this as sum i 1 to 3 epsilon i i divided by 3 or symbol wise I can write this as epsilon i sum i runs from 1 to 3 divided by 3. Now, we will see in later phase that Einstein summation symbol can be used in stress strain studies where we just do not write this summation symbol and i 1 to 3. If I just avoid it, I will write it as epsilon i i divided by 3 or I can write as epsilon i divided by 3 indicating epsilon m. We are now going to see the deviatoric strain epsilon 1 dash along the axis 1 along this direction. In another way, we can write epsilon 1 1 dash which is equal to epsilon 1 minus epsilon m or in another way epsilon 1 1 minus epsilon m. So, what is epsilon m is here. So, epsilon 1 1 minus epsilon m if this is done we get 2 epsilon 1 1 minus epsilon 2 2 minus epsilon 3 3 divided by 3 
or in another way of writing instead of 1 1 if I write 1 it is 2 epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2 minus epsilon 3 divided by 3. So this or this or we can write simply as epsilon 1 minus epsilon m and as I said epsilon 1 1 minus epsilon m. Similarly, one can write expression for epsilon 2 dash which means the dibiotomic strain along direction 2 or epsilon 2 2 dash and similarly epsilon 3 dash the dibiotomic strain along direction 3 or epsilon 3 3 dash that those can be written. So, here also we note that the sum of the dibiotomic strain in 3 directions this means epsilon 1 dash plus epsilon 2 dash plus epsilon 3 dash is equal to or the same or the different symbol has been used sum of epsilon dash 1 1 plus epsilon 2 2 dash plus epsilon 3 3 dash will be equal to or now this sum can also be written in, um, in Einstein summation symbol as epsilon i dash or epsilon i i double dash where this summation symbol and this summation symbols are avoided that sum becomes equal to 0. You can write down here epsilon 2 dash and epsilon 3 dash accordingly sum up and you will find that the sum becomes 0. So, as I told it is same as definition wise mean stress and the deviatoric stress.